Alrighty, so Sal, you are still hanging out with us right here on Y254 TV. A very good morning to you and welcome back. This right here is Y in the Morning and the segment is Entrepreneurship Tuesday and Health Tuesday as well, where we talk about matters, health and your welfare. And also if you want to venture into business and get your hack, you know, those little hacks that you need to actually establish something uh, for yourself that will make you money. Uh, literally, that is the mo most important part, is what we are all about right here. So you can plug in using the hashtag, uh, why in the morning, that is on all our social media platforms, and on Facebook as well, Twitter as well, at Y254 channel. And personally, you can find me at uh, Brian Sakwa 101 on the hashtag, why in the morning. And uh, on our health segment today, uh, we are talking about child child and maternal health care and uh, we have our guest who is live in studio with us today but before i get to the guest i just i just want to read for you uh, a little bit of uh two three insights here before we get into the conversation and our guest who's already with us in studio it says worldwide the mortality rate for children under five dropped from 87 deaths that is per a thousand live births in 1990 to 51% and that includes a thousand of the birth live birth in 2011 and despite this enormous accomplishment most countries and this includes developing countries Kenya on spot did not meet the millennium uh, development goals and increasingly up to uh, they say increasingly child deaths are concentrated in most poorest regions and in low-income settings with maternal mortality rates ranging from 150 to more than 1,000 per 10,000 live births, which while rates are still but still with neonatal mortality rate generally ranging from 20 to 40 per 100 birth. On top of that, it says every child deserves to have a healthy start in life and fortunately every year millions of parents lose their children to preventable illnesses because they do not have access to life-saving childhood vaccines and equally every every mother should have access to quality health care during pregnancy and childbirth that is according to the world health organization with more than 800 women die every day from complications in pregnancy and childbirth and also breastfeeding problems the majority of this death can be prevented with the right resources and care and i love that you know it mentioned also on the vaccines part which is actually a conversation right now and uh we have uh, dr uh, rain mwendwa who is a pediatrician who will be joining us live in studio who is joining us live in studio right now to take on this topic about child and maternal health care good morning to you mr Rain Mwandwa. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming through. Uh, before we get to the whole conversation, first of all, I'd like if you, if you were to introduce yourself, maybe what are some of the titles you hold as well, apart from uh, being a professional you know, pediatrician or a child specialist in other words. So, Dr. Rain, I wear many hats. A lot of people know me on Dr. Rain through social media, but um, in the more professional spaces, I'm Dr. Mwandwa. Um, I'm a pediatrician, um, I'm also a child health advocate, um, amongst other things, I'm, I'm practicing in Kenya, I have my own uh, license. practice, and okay. um, I see pediatrician, I mean, I see kids in, uh, in the pediatric clinic, so yeah, and then other than that, I do content creation, um, I double a bit with activism, right. I'm a fitness activist i am you know an influencer of health basically right yeah. i love the i love the part the influence of health you know a lot of people will be like hey Kwani, what's not happening right now you can actually you know venture in any space especially i love the fact that you know you took up the digital space and you are doing it as well now mm -hmm. when it comes to uh child health care if somebody is watching back at home and uh, they're wondering Kwani, what is child health care see compared to chakula lale but uh what does it entail exactly when we say child health care and you mentioned you're also an activist as well so child health basically is anything that will enable a child to thrive. It's important in life for children to thrive, not just to survive. Right. And thriving is so many factors. It means thriving in the mental space, so psychologically. Um, it means thriving um, health-wise, so the physical ailment, um, just 
the aspect of the child being healthy, growth and development. Um, we look at things like um, the environment that they're exposed to. Um, all of that is a contribution to child health because kids are basically the future of the generation. They're the future. They're the ones who are going to continue living right. in this world and, and, and hopefully taking care of the world. So right. child health just looks at that scope and we look at kids. There's different cohorts. So you have infants, which are kids below one year. You have neonates, which are, you know, a baby who is born. A, new, a newborn is what we call a neonate. And then you have the school-going children, you have your adolescents and teenagers, all the way up to like 19 years is just children, child health. That's all making sure that they have a good environment to, to thrive and not to survive. Yeah, to thrive and not to survive. And speaking of that, you know, uh, there's uh, mothers who come from, you know, homes that they do not have the facilities to actually ensure that their kids are safe. Even when it comes to also uh, matters health, the health conditions, including hygiene as well. And, uh, you know, they'll come and say, eh, me, boram toto akule, akunyu alale. But from, from you, from your expertise experience, what exactly does it entail to ensure that a child is, you said, in a safer environment and also does not thrive? or uh, does not survive, but they thrive. What exactly is that environment for an infant as well? Because this is literally from infant to now, you know, even adulthood as well. I would say it's very much on the leadership that you have in your country, policies that are in place, the laws, the constitution. All right. So those are very important. And if, those, those, if you have policies in place and constitutions and rules in place, to make sure that's why we have child rights yeah we have child rights yeah child rights and we have things like uh, uh, unicef that try to ensure that the child is protected because it is vital it shows that for any any population to thrive you must take care of the of the children so it's it's basically making sure that policies are in place and that they are followed as our constitution, we have the Children's Act, which is there, which is there to protect the children. So as long as those things are implemented, ensuring that they are provided with the right education, ensuring that they are protected, that they don't face any adverse childhood events when they are children, any traumas in, in forms of abuse, um, whatever kind of abuse, neglect that is going to be exposed to them that can actually impair their growth um, and development as children. So as long as Policies are in place, the rest is just to trickle down, making sure those policies are implemented. And in Kenya, we are lucky enough, we do have those policies where we have a problem is with implementation. Yeah. And, 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 and even when it comes to the government, uh, like you said, uh, with issues of implementation, would you say there have been gaps that uh, as a pediatrician yourself uh, you've managed and even, even in your pediatrician community as well, would you say there are gaps that you managed to fill and right now uh, we are trying to actually, we are on the road to goodness? Um, well, I wish I could say we're on the road to goodness. Healthcare in this country is, is not really a priority to me. Um, the way the government looks at it. Um, so the African countries met one time and sat down and realized that if you invest on health, you actually have better outcomes in terms of the economies for your countries, for your African countries. Right. And there was something called the Abuja Declaration where each country had declared that 15% of their national or yearly budget would go towards healthcare so that different functions of healthcare can be financed in order to improve the general health of, of people. We have never achieved that as, as a nation, as a country, uh, since the Abuja Declaration. The only country that has managed to do that is Rwanda. Um, right. And it's, it's a big problem. So when you talk about challenges, there's a lot of, of challenges in terms of, of health. I think the pandemic exposed just how weak our healthcare system was exposing that we don't even have our own supplies of oxygen. We don't produce our own oxygen. It showed the, the capacities of um, intensive care units and high dependency units in this country. It showed that there was such a gap. It showed you also the issues with human resource uh, and healthcare in this country. And granted, we are a low middle income um, country trying to move to the middle income uh, phase, but we have these challenges um, where we don't get supported. The health systems don't get supported. 
So right now, infant mortality rate or the child mortality rate is 34 per 1,000 live births. It's, right. We still haven't achieved that. That's 2020 statistics. Um, we, we have a maternal mortality rate, which means that uh, any mother who is childbearing or pregnant or a few days after pregnancy dies, that's what we call the maternal mortality rate. We're at a, a 167 uh, per 100,000. Um, not, we're at 356 actually, with the target is supposed to be 167. That was the target that was set to reduce right. to that level. To reduce, uh, but we are at 356 currently. Which is quite a high number. So. It is extremely high. Yeah. One of the people that contribute a lot to that is children. The adolescent age between 10 to 19 years through teenage pregnancies. Just in right. January and February this year, 700 girls were getting pregnant teenage mothers. Would you attribute that to the pandemic? Sorry. Yes, I definitely attribute it to the pandemic because schools are sort of a haven for, for, and they offer protection. So when the girls go to school, when the boys go to school, they are sort of in a social protective um, institution because when they stay home and there's unemployment and there's poverty um, and there's frustration, there's a higher chance of um, you know, gender-based violence to, to occur and some of that is sexual gender-based violence right. that would lead to these teenage pregnancies. It's very unfortunate that, you know, it took uh, that tangent. Now, you're speaking of the pandemic. Um, when uh, the pandemic struck, you, uh, you actually were on the spot to actually, you know, fill in the gap about misinformation. And it actually put you on the map. I remember you did a lot of interviews that time. Uh, what exactly were you trying to clarify to people? Because I remember you did an interview and even the reactions were, who is this doctor who is an artist as well? Because, you know, people had not known that you are also a doctor mm. and still you are an artist linked to also a very famous and renowned musician in this country as well yeah so yeah i think covid is what um put me in the social media spotlight um i've never really been on social media that you know hi this is my channel type of thing but because of the misinformation that was going around during the covid19 pandemic you know, everybody had their conclusions and don't have any medical background, you don't have any expertise, and all of a sudden you know about this virus and things like that. So I felt it's important to come in a space where I get my information that is evidence-based, it's scientific-based, on actually debunking some of these myths that were going around, because it was crazy back then. It's, hard, right. it's, it's, it's only now that we're forgetting certain things, but people are being told to take all sorts of drugs, to do right. all sorts of crazy things. Some people even saying pee can, can cure COVID. So yeah. it was a time where I felt more of us need to be fight misinformation and use different um, platforms and that was social media. So yeah, um, did, did plenty of interviews then. I think now I'm a bit of a household name in terms of you know online presence, in terms yeah. of healthcare, in terms of you know just Basically, if there's something that needs to be debunked health-wise, right. I'm the go-to guy right now on social media in terms right. of healthcare. Yeah. Right. I can test that because I was watching during that time. Now, uh, speaking of that as well, you have your segment called uh, Ask Dr. Rain or Dr. Rain, Ask, Ask Dr. Rain. Um, so, yeah, like I said, one of the things I do, I'm a, I'm a content creator. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm a director to a production company, a media production company. So one of the things we do, we do different uh, productions. And one of them was um, my own channel called Ask Dr. Rain, which okay. was basically what we called healthcare in the eyes of the hip hop doctor, um, right. where I looked, um, given the feedback I got on social media, I thought there is a fresh way in which we can bring healthcare to the table so that the youth can you know, make it really easy for, for people to consume because a lot of our health um, information platforms, um, sorry to say on mainstream media, is, is really very heavy medical jargon. We don't know how to, you know, we don't know how to break things down to the common, common person. Manage, and that's, yeah. that's, that's something that I think every, every doctor, every practitioner or healthcare worker should be able to do. Right. Because once they're informed, once your patient is informed, then they make better decisions and you, you can prevent a lot of, um, you know, diseases and miscomings and people make the right choice. Right. Before, before you answer what exactly contributes to some of this, uh, uh, this large number of uh, high mortality rates, you mentioned you're also a hip-hop, a hip-hop, uh, you're a hip-hop doctor? 
yeah, or yeah. life of a music do doctor and also uh, uh, a pediatrician. So uh, when people actually uh, try to find out who you are, it was actually amazing to see that, you know, this guy is not only just a child specialist, but he's also, um, he's also musically aligned, like in the creative aspect of it all. And also you're married to, you know, Della, who was a very famous artist way, way back, who took a sabbatical in the music industry as well. So when uh, parents actually come to consult from you and they realize, you know, I'm coming to consult from a hip hop doctor, do they sometimes get scared and they'll be like, nope, me, I don't want to leave my child with this kind of a doctor. I'm a, but what, let's say, who are some of the people that come to you for consultations? Um, I would say, yeah, relatively young people. Um, most of my, um, of my, the parents to my patients are usually young people, any, any range from like 20, 22, going to, to 30s. So right. those those are most most of my patients. I do see older older ones who have older kids as well, um, but that's the majority of my patients. Um, I've not encountered any issues um, with my patients, like saying, "Oh, you do music, you do this and that, and is this serious or or whatever." No, because I think one of the ways that I portray myself as well on social media is that I try to be very unfiltered to the world to show people that. Yes, you're a child specialist. Yes, you're a neurosurgeon. But before you're all of those things that people consider is superhuman, yes. you're yes. a human being. True. So before I became a doctor, I had my own passions. I had my own talents that I used to pursue. And that was in the creative space. And I just happened to continue doing them. I'm not as active in music um, as I was back then. But right. now that time or when time is there, of course, I still... I still try create, I still go to the studio, things like that. Right. Yeah. And so just come up with that creative vibe of music. Do you listen to beats as well? To beats? Uh, music beats that actually give you inspiration. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, so yeah. if you're going to create music, um, you have to have a lot of friends who produce uh, music. I don't do um, music production myself um, in, in terms of uh, beat making, but yeah, I listen to beats. That's where you get inspiration. That's where you get a flow. That's where you get a style to, okay, this, this song is going to go this way. This is going to be a drill beat. This is going to be a bit of a boom bap type of style. Right. This is going to be a more mel melancholic kind of song. Right. So it's, the beats will actually drive the conversation and what you want to, to, to bring to the table. Interesting, and we'll come back to that. Now, back uh, to our child healthcare and mortality rates. Uh, uh, if, if, for example, we were to actually have a sport check in our country right now, uh, what would you say are the, say, heavy factors? Let me say heavy factors that actually contribute to some of this, you know, child mortality rate. Uh, we have neonatal or uh, maternal health care issues that actually fester in our country. What would you say is like the biggest cause to them, both in urban and rural areas as well? Okay, so... I've worked in, in the public sector and I've also worked in the private sector. Okay. So being exposed to both of those settings or setups um, for years now, it's, it always boils down to one thing to me. It's the support, the lack of support that we have. If we are supported more, because trust me, we have very brilliant minds out there um, from specialists, from researchers, um, from, you know, scientists, all the way down to nurses and, and you know, clinical officers and the like. Right. We have brilliant minds. Yeah. They just need to be supported. They just need the right infrastructure. Yeah. A lot of them just need to be, in, you know, employed. Right. Now, if we get the right type of uh, infrastructure yeah. and healthcare workers are supported, healthcare workers are, 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 you know, working in a conducive environment, a hospital has drugs, a hospital has you know, basic um, equipment, equipment yep. you know, consumables. Right. Then you get healthcare workers who actually get satisfied um, at what they do, right. uh, working as, as a healthcare working, delivering healthcare services. Right. Those are the things that will improve our healthcare in this, in this country. Right. Because in the private sector, you can see a different thing where it's like everything is there, whatever you need is there. Right. You don't have to leave the hospital to go and buy a drug. You don't have to, you know, 
wait or transfer the patient to go and, to go and be seen by a, another specialist because in your county, that specialist is not there. Right. So all these things are, are very doable. All if right. we just have accountability, if the funds that are actually supposed to be going to do something are actually used, right. if the taxes are put into the right space, if people are funded properly, NHIF works properly, then we can achieve what we call universal health care. And that's right. the, the, what people want to achieve, but at the moment I, I don't see it happening with the way systems are. Uh, and would you say, um, ac according to the outgoing government system that has been there, or the leadership system that has been there, and the incoming one, would you say the, the one that is actually leaving the stage tried, I'm a, I'm a, for, from your experience as well, or from your point of view and perspective, in terms of even alleviating that and creating that you know, space to advocate you know, for uh, enough child health care, would you say the outgoing government tried its best? And also, if yes or no, uh, the incoming government, what are some of the things maybe you would want them to consider just in case maybe they're watching and since you're a specialist, what are some of the call action that you'd like them to do in terms of even advocating for that space when it comes to child and maternal health care as well? So, yeah, I would say, I wouldn't say there's, there's, there's nothing that they did yeah, that okay. was positive. So I must, I must applaud that. Um, what we know from the ministries is that actually Uhuru Kenyatta's term was the best um, managed healthcare docket right. since healthcare in terms of even budget allocation and things like that. Right. But yes, also, there are flaws. Like the biggest right. problem that ever happened to healthcare in this country was healthcare being devolved because right. healthcare was devolved illegally. Yeah. In this country, there was no public participation. Stakeholders such as the healthcare workers were not really involved in that devolution. Okay. And we're seeing a problem because now every county has their own ways of going about healthcare, taking charge of healthcare. Then it's very dependent on which governor you have. Right. So you have this disparity where counties that are managed well um, have good healthcare and other counties don't, but that creates inequality. And that goes against your constitutional right where everybody has the, the equal right to the highest attainable quality of health care. Right. So the biggest problem was devolution. It still is uh, devolution. Right. We need things in place like a health service commission. It's still very early to say whether this incoming government is, is, going, to, is going to do better. Right. But uh, in terms of governors, um, we can see two governors, uh, Governor Sakaja right. um, and uh, Governor Abdi Nasir in, in Mombasa right. have set up, you know, task forces, um, health task force to actually go and do like a root cause analysis or a feasibility study to check what is really going on. Where are the gaps? How can we improve? You know, where are we doing well? And things like that. So those are the only two governors. The rest of the governors uh, and, and leadership has really been going in at uh, healthcare workers and things like that. Right. Crazy articles going around about, you know, doctors being malicious and, right. and that's, that's the narrative of the Which is government. not true, right? Of course it's not true. Of course it's not true. It's an article that was released, um, I think on Saturday. It was on the front page, Saturday Nation. Um, okay. It was called Doctor's Con Game, and it was really, really poorly done. Poor, poor journalism, not well researched, thought about. Um, you know, other other aspects were not looked into. So, right, it is what it is. Yeah, but I love the fact that you know you are also positively and massively advocating for the right ways to actually you know have doctors you know being looked at as more professional as compared to that lingo that you know was used there. Now speaking of also that, uh, when it comes to even sensitization of uh, proper child and healthcare, and I love the fact that in uh, in the middle uh, you initially mentioned about you know the COVID nineteen pandemic being a high contributing factor to uh, the child. Uh, uh, say early child uh, early, early pregnancies that actually you know was brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic so uh, when it comes to sensitization uh, even breastfeeding 
itself. Uh, these young girls uh, who have already, you know, gone through that uh, experience, maybe what are some of the things that they should know? Because uh, we are looking at young girls who have already given birth and the young mothers, they don't have much information. They're in rural areas, but still they have to raise this kid. They can't throw the kid away. So even when it comes to sensitization and the information they need, what exactly should they maybe be given to ensure that, you know, they maintain that uh, proper curve of child health care and maternally as well? So the teenage thing is, is, is really, it should be such a big, big, big priority because 700 girls getting pregnant per day from January to February is alarming. Right. And this is this year. By this, this is time, this year only. This, this is this year. We're talking right. about this year. This year, right. That's 45,000 girls in two months. Now, what, two does, months. what does that mean? Yeah, this is from age 10 to 19. To 19, yeah. That's, that's the population that they looked at. Right. And this means that, one, a child who has right to education, once they fall pregnant, it becomes a problem because you're going to carry this child for 10 months in your tummy. Then after that, you're going to deliver. You're not going to go rush back immediately to school. You're going to lose. You're going to lose out. Taking care of this child, if this young girl does not have the support for this child to be taken care of, it means that now she has to take care of this human being. And that means she might not be able to go to school. She might have to stay home, take care of her child, go look for a job somewhere just to, to, to be able to provide for a child because she has nobody. She has, the father is not there. Maybe her parents are not there. Her parents have, have passed on. Or not okay. supportive. In yeah, other or cases. not supportive. Right. That's one. Two is if she's lucky enough to make it because the reason why the maternal deaths in this country, the highest is in that same population, right. between 10 to 19 years, 15 and above, is because the birth canal, this is still a child. Yeah. You're, you're a child who is carrying a child. Uh, your, a child carrying your, a child. Your anatomy right. is not mature enough mature for enough, childbearing. Yeah. Right. So a lot of complications. You put yourself at risk. At risk, yeah. Just giving birth can kill the mother. Right. Um, it puts the baby at risk because they can be premature. So at the same time, you're also increasing the infant mortality rate. It means that this baby might come uh, very low birth weight, not able to catch a disease and die very quickly, and you're contributing to more of that. So it's all interconnected. If you, if you don't give these young kids 10, 19 years, something we call comprehensive sexuality education. Sexuality education, yeah. Where we talk about different things such as contraception. Right. We talk about family planning. We talk right. about gender, sexual orientation, your right. reproductive health rights your rights as a human being or as a woman, uh, right. where you cannot go into early marriage, forced early marriages, where you, where you decline things like, uh, you know, FGM, FGM, you know. Right. And all, the, all of those things, all of those things um, combined are what, what we need to do to be able to reduce your, your, your teenage pregnancies. You need to empower people for them to make the right choices, right. you know. The, the problem is that a lot of people are fighting this. Because right. when you talk about contraception, yeah. then you have to fight the, the Catholic Church. The religious, is it the Catholic Church or the whole it's, religious yeah, it's, sector? It's, right. it's very religious, you know, and, and we're a nation that, you know, religion runs things, yeah? Christianity right. runs things. And right. we put, sometimes we, we decide because of our faith that we will ignore the science, we will ignore the data, we will right. ignore that 700 girls per day are getting pregnant. We right. will ignore that 10 to 19 years, HIV is the highest. It's the highest, right. And because we are of faith, in a particular faith that says we don't do those things, right. we won't do them. Won't so do them. that's, yeah. that's so it's, where it's we... It's also one of the major obstacles in that Exactly. Space. Culture, uh, our cultural and religious uh, values, values sometimes, right. can sometimes right. cause a big rift between the scientific evidence that we provide and it's usually thrown that, oh, this is from the white people, these are things from the white people, and we're right. trying to bring yeah. in gays and lesbians and, yeah. and things like that. 
Right. Uh, we can't do this without even talking about also the issue at hand, which is uh, uh, the trying to act the Ministry of Health is advocating for uptake of uh, COVID-19 boosters. Is actually a story that's also developing in all news outlets, and now in new in new experience as well as a pediatrician, they are also advocating for children to you know go and get these vaccines. And I remember we had a conversation, and you told me that in the U.S. we even had up to children as 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 early as five years of age. Let's say, let's say from five to around twelve because a 13 year already a teenager in some other countries as well. In Kenya, would you advocate for our parents to go take their kids to be vaccinated against COVID-19? Definitely. Definitely, right. definitely. I'm a pediatrician. That means that I am an advocate for vaccination and immunization because we start giving vaccines to children from birth. As soon as the baby is born, we give them a vaccine. Right. And these are things that we know that work. The science and, and evidence is out there. The studies have even been done on babies six months already right. for right. the COVID-19. I'll give an example of the influenza vaccine, which is a vaccine we give also to prevent complicated um, influ uh, pneumonia caused by the influenza virus or the flu virus. Right. We give babies the influenza vaccine at six months and right. give them another booster at seven months. Right. So once the studies are out, the data, the evidence is out, the safety um, is out there, WHO approves FDA approves, we go ahead and we will recommend, I will be one of the people shouting on top of the roofs. Right. I have already had this conversation on my, on my platform that Ask once, parade. yeah, right. I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm actually just waiting to get the go ahead. Right. Personally, I'm waiting to, to vaccinate my son who is like How old 10 months is now. 10 months yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting to be okay. given the go ahead and it's allowed. Right. Uh, we can't also do this without talking about, you know, uh, the COVID-19, uh, not COVID-19 rather, that is mental health. Uh, uh, so September is uh, Suicide Prevention Month as well. And this incorporates uh, mental health awareness. From your activism point of view, uh, what would you say uh, some of the things that you can do to ensure that we continue spreading awareness about even mantas, uh, mental health awareness? Even kids as well. Kids get depressed as well. Kids yeah. get stressed, you know. And sometimes even parents are not easy to tell that, you know, your child is depressed and they need you know help so from your experience what are some of the things that we can do to ensure that we set the bar clear and everything is in place as, we Indiv as individuals one of the things we can do as individuals and uh, as a community and as a society what we can do is a lot of our mental health issues stem from our early childhood experiences right so that's why it's so important to protect the child and advocate for the child Right. Because these things, we call them adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences. experiences. Right. And these things, child abuse, neglect, um, all of these things and how, so. how they grew up will actually influence whether a child becomes when, uh, grows up to become depressed, right. grows up to have any mental health issues like anxiety, right. and all those things can later on lead to suicide. Right. So it's, it's important that we take responsibility of, of our children, we take care of them, we nurture them, we protect them in as much as possible. And also the community to make sure that this child is also protected in case they're always alert, in case of abuse, in case there's an uncle who is known to Abuse have certain them, things, you know. Uh, you know. Um, and then the rest is systematic now, is right. you know, alleviating poverty, um, ensuring right. that there's no overcrowding, <coughs> and all those things that, you know, that's more of government in government leadership. In leadership. But right. individually, just create an environment for your child to thrive to and right. they won't grow up with, with mental health issues. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm being told we are out of time, but uh, no I'll ask two, three questions. Uh, uh, quickly, quickly, uh, do you have maybe a place that if people want to access uh, or consult you for, you know, uh, when it comes to matters, uh, child and maternal health care, do you have like a hospital? Yeah, so platform, etc. You can yeah. book a pediatric uh, consultation at All Mirazi right. Speciality. At Mirazi Speciality Clinic, we are on 40 suits uh, on the 8th floor, suit 8 or 9. So you just need to give us a call and uh, book an appointment and you ask for Dr. Number? Rain. You have a number where they can book a call? Um, do I have it? I can say it off. Yeah, sure, you can say it off. And uh, the social media as well. Okay, as so the social media on Instagram, it's at Mirazi. On Twitter, it's also at Mirazi. Uh, this is a speciality clinic. We, you can see not only Dr. Rain, you can see from plastic surgeons to urologists to psychiatrists, counselors. So the clinic number is 
book the appointment, get seen by a you know, qualified health professional and we'll sort you out. Right. Uh, as we exit, uh, how's Della? <laughs> how's Della? But though she took a break from music, we've not heard from her yeah. for a very long time. Yeah, is, Della is, she is just focusing on very, motherhood? Yeah. very engulfed in, in, in being a mom. She's trying to be a good mom. Yeah, she's, she's just uh, dealing with the, the struggle of motherhood, of right, motherhood now. right Yeah, but she's good. She's good. She's going to make music. We'll see her make a comeback soon. I do not want to speak for Please her. Please push when, her. When, when, Please when, push she, her. when <laughs> she decides, she decides. She'll tell tell you guys. her at why we are rooting her for so her music. That one I'll so. tell her, yeah. You'll definitely. tell her, yeah, right? That I'll tell uh, her. But she's also open to do interviews. Um, I'm not sure. You'd, you're not you'd sure. have you'd have to ask her. You'll have to yeah. ask her. Yeah. Please, please ensure that you right. you send our warm regards to her and tell no her worries. we are rooting out for her music as well. Uh, that has been uh, Doctor Rain Mwendwa talking to us about matters child and maternal healthcare. Thank you so much once again for taking your time to hang Thank out you. with us. We would maybe love to have a part two of this again, and definitely sure we will invite you once again. But on that note, we are taking a short break. When we come back, we've got you again with an ample and personal on our entrepreneurship segment today where we're going to talk about Mattis business. How do you ensure that, you know, you have a good business? What are some of those hacks that you need back at home? Keep it on the hashtag Why in the Morning on all our social media platforms.